your book ends with the same towards purpose. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think that's an a massive key <laughs> to realign guys. Um, and so what I wonder is, is if men are attracted into a spiritual tradition, which is dominated and often identified with um, peak sexual experience, which, which you know, it is often the case, generally because we have all these people running around calling themselves Tantra teachers who actually know nothing about real Tantric tradition. like. Welcome, Aaron, to Manifesto's YouTube channel. Mm, nice to be here, brother. Good. You've been writing this thing to me, brother, all the time since we first got in touch. And I got to tell you, I'm like, dude, I'm not your brother. Don't call me your brother. Like, <laughs> like I'm the internet who I don't know. Uh, but we're going to have a conversation now about all kinds of stuff. But I think that we might come back to that one. So let, let's see. Um, <laughs> oh, let's do it. I, I like it. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, Aaron, you are, I've got this from your website, you are a divine masculine teacher of embodied awakening and tantric mm. practitioner. Mm. Can you tell me, what does that mean? Well, that means a, a variety of different things. So I'm a, actually a ship's captain, a merchant mariner by trade. <laughs> that's something different than a divine. No, I, I, that, that's a, quite, quite a big difference. But in my early 20s, I did a master's in spiritual psychology and really dove deeper into the field of transformation, mindfulness. I was teaching and speaking from stage, uh, working with some of the best known names and people in the world of, of personal development. Um, and then I, I was pretty done with the industry. I kind of got disillusioned. I saw a lot of people speaking and teaching one thing from stage and then their lives dictating something else. And I said, this is all a joke. And I went back to my cruise ship in Hawaii for many years and did that. And then, you know, kind of down the road, had a few experiences and realized, hey, yeah, there's something more I want to do than just surf and, you know, make love with women in Hawaii. So um, I found really the world of deeper embodiment. I found the world where all of a sudden my mind could get out of the way and I could drop into the deeper mystery inside. And, you know, embodiment for me and the, the Embodied Awakening Academy, which I run with my last partner, what I find often happens for people in the spiritual journey is it's, and it's a, a, an ascension. And really the descension down into the body is finding divinity inside of everything. And divinity, not a, you know, amorphic God in the sky, but more of a day-to-day -day grand organized design of this kind of chaotic, wild universe to which we live in. So what I help people do is come back into their own heart. And to come back into their own heart means a deeper mastery of the human experience. And mastering the human experience means that there's an awareness of the mind, the heart, the emotions, the sex center, none of them more stronger than the other, but each one informing each other to come into a place where somebody can learn how to be more aligned to the inspiration of their soul. So the embodiment really, to me, at the end of the day is people's incarnation in this body. They're living in alignment with what, the, with what they've really come here to do. That, that sounds interesting. I think there's a lot for us. So, so I, you know, I've, I've, we've, we've decided to have this conversation because I've been on a journey myself from kind of, you know, business and, you know, secular lifestyle and, and most of my life as an atheist, uh, through the world of Tantra and spirituality. Um, and, and today I'm an Orthodox Christian. I converted to Orthodox, I was baptized Orthodox two years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I can really agree with a lot of things that you just said. I, I think it was very incredibly well put. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of stuff that I agree there. And then my, 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 my goal with this conversation is to dig into some of the things that I saw as some of the, the challenges or dangers of what I would call new age spirituality. Uh, and and mm -hmm. to you as in someone who's active in the field today and, and probably has a, a very first hand knowledge of it as well so so yeah that's what we're going to try and do and, and we'll see where that goes i I, I I love it i love the intention <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, good I, and i think i mean hats off to you for for stepping in for the interview i think it's it's great because you you might get to see all kinds of stuff that i have of, from from the industry as well that has you know i'm aware it's going to have nothing to do with you but i i thought it'd be interesting to start at least getting to know you a little bit more and and your background um, because mm -hmm. because i think that that's yeah, that, that, that's gonna, that needs to be the foundation for, for any other discussion is from our own experience as well, right? And maybe I'll get to share a little bit of myself as well. Let's, let's see how it goes. Um, but you gave like the very short version of, of how you got into this. 
um, and 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 what it is. But maybe can you just talk a little bit? I read on your website it says that you well, you just told me actually before we started the interview that you grew up on a farm, and I just bought a farm hmm. as well. So that that's really great, and I'm really appreciating like the deeper connection to nature out here. Um, and, and, and I'm guessing that's a part of what you have as well. But you also said it was a chaotic start to life in, in your life. Can, can, can you tell a little bit about that, like where you, where you come from and your roots? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I grew up in a, um, a town about half hour outside of Boston, Irish Catholic town. You know, I, I say I, I got a master's degree in alcoholism in high school. And then by the time I went to a maritime academy, I had a, a PhD in alcoholism. So it was a small Irish, Irish Catholic town with a lot of drinking. I learned how to drink at a young age. Um, and that was really the, the nature of what I dealt with, the chaos. I watched my parents get divorced. My dad lived out of his car. My parents go bankrupt. You know, the, there was a lot of chaos financially emotionally psychologically i was kind of the the poor kid living in a very wealthy suburban town um and you know i compared myself to others there was a lot of challenge and confusion inside of me on many different levels you know actually when i was mentioned earlier working for a self-development publishing company in my early 20s the story i shared inside of that series was thank God I was raised in chaos. And I really feel that way. Like I wouldn't have wanted it any other way because it made me the man I, I am. And you know, the, the farm piece, so actually my family's farm, which is out in Western Massachusetts is one of the founding farms of America. Um, it, it dates back all the way to some of the, like my great, 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 great grandfathers are John Adams and John Quincy Adams. So it's like presidential, um you know family if you will so the the fa the farm that i would spend my summers on and often go out for various amount of times was a dairy farm mm -hmm. you know but i loved working outside i loved just the way of being with the farm and i love that you know you bought a farm out in denmark and you're being with the land and you know what i find with all all of this work it's like it, it's really coming back home into our body into our heart and my preference in my day-to-day -day world i'm traveling and teaching a lot right now but i have a piece of land that i just got out in bali and i'm just uh finalizing some land in costa rica like i want to be building in community building structures working with bamboo in the garden still spend you know a couple hours a day i can hop on a zoom call and do some client work and you know and, and work with the people i have you know that i've been developing with the last many years but really i like putting my feet into the earth i, I like connecting to to Pachamama in that way. Yeah, so I, I, I get it like that sound yeah, that alcoholism is terrible. <laughs> and and I get that <laughs> that must be really destructive. And then there must have been something in your childhood that really it, it seems like you've been a guy like on the go and you've been also successful with everything that you've done uh since a very early age as well. So what do you think it was that that from your childhood that you received that that gave you that that ability well I, I think one of the things that i have and you know if you talk to a couple of my past partners like one partner would call me the persistent fucker you know because there's this part of me there's this persistence inside when i set a goal like i just released a book this this past december and i had certain goals and i actually blew through quite a few of those goals so there's a persistent part of my being that knows how to get things done and so from a young age when i saw the world i was living in and you know part of my inspiration to going to a maritime military school was that i knew i could go and have a little bit of a challenging four-year education and put on a uniform and be inside that but then i could have full freedom when i got out and i knew that freedom is what i wanted so I had a goal of, you know, by the time I was 30 of being, of, you know, setting foot in over 50 countries around the world. And I, I met that goal, you know, and, and I've traveled a lot. I've seen a lot of the planet. I've had amazing experiences and they just continue to expand. So what supported me was, you know, having a strong will, a will of when everything is coming at me and yet still being the fish that's swimming upstream saying, hey, no, I'm going in this direction. I don't care what any of you guys are saying. And that level of persistence is what supported me to, to continue to succeed in that way. And, and honestly, you know, I think that will is inside of many of us. It, it lives within us, but sometimes it's not always directed to being 
what I would call in beneficial presence on this planet that will can sometimes be manipulative in nature and getting things to to try to feel better about yourself and so working through a lot of those triggers and charges and personal development but then really coming back into my heart saying how is it that I want to show up like how can I just be a beneficial presence on this planet and what does that look like and utilizing that same will that's driven me so much through the years one of the things we talk a lot about in, in men's work is like the need for role models and for, you know, kind of men as as guides for each other. There's the saying that, you know, women give birth to boys, but men give birth to men. So have you had any role models or mentor figures in, in your life or even just like heroes from, you know, the public discourse or something like that that have been inspiring for you or that have, have touched your life, would you say? Oh, yeah, yeah. And actually, I actually I have the follow-up question that we spoke about earlier that, that I also wanted yeah, to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been a, a variety of, of ones, you know. I, I say, like, from, from my dad, he definitely wasn't a, a somebody I looked at as somebody I wanted to be, mm -hmm. but he had a great capacity to listen and hear. But our relationship drastically changes. When change, when I was fourteen, I counseled him out of his gambling addiction in a three-hour conversation, mm. and that was like, okay, you're my dad, but you're kind of like my friend now. So that changed a lot. Yeah. Um, and yeah, right around that, really early, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to like learn how to counsel my father, and it, it was like, okay, we're kind of friends now, mm -hmm. but in a way, because that friendship was there, I grew up a little bit quicker. But we can have conversations about drugs, about alcohol, about life, about women, about all these things that I witnessed a lot of other guys my same age, they, they couldn't have those conversations. So I was really appreciative for him in that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right around that same age, I had a my, my soccer, my football coach, you know, not, you know, real, real football, not American football. I played mm -hmm. for, for a long time when I was younger. Huh. Um, he was one of these guys that always really believed in me. You know, and I and I really appreciated that, you know, and I struggled in different ways, but he always kind of looked me in the eyes and he said, hey, like, I, I believe in you, like, you're you're amazing, like, you're really good. And I was, I, you know, I played on some professional Olympic development teams. Soccer was my full way of life through about for four or five years. It's what kept me probably out of jail and out of a lot of trouble. It's like spending countless hours on a soccer field. So very appreciative for him in those days, for sure so vital for young men to find something that they can pour their energy into and, and be confirmed with it. Like there's something I'm good at. Uh, I have yeah. a 15 year old now who's, um, who's, who's oh, wow. finding that as well. And it's, it's really exciting uh, to follow mm. it. Um, so yeah, the, the question that I warned you about was actually, and, and this is something I asked lots of men that, that we talk with is if there was a man from history that you could sit down and have a conversation with, mm. then who would that be? And what would you talk about? You know, the, the first thing that comes to mind actually is, is Abraham Lincoln. Um, <laughs> wow. And, and, wow. and the, the, the thing I think I would talk to, you know, I've, I've read a, a decent amount about Lincoln and, and just the time period in which he was in power. And there was a humbleness to his power as well. Like there's this place of like the honest Abe that there was a humbleness, but a deep honesty in terms of how he communicated. And I think what I would talk about was, you know, just to get a more firsthand understanding of his own values in terms of where the the American world constitution life was at at that time. It would be very fascinating. You know, I mean, my brother is a, a political, you know, teaches in political philosophy. He's a presidential scholar. You know, we actually just caught up over this last weekend in, uh, in in Texas. He teaches down there now, and you know, we often talk about a lot of philosophy together and and theory and understandings. And yeah, I I've never dove deeply into all of that. Like definitely in the field of of, of philosophy and, and different teachers and Socrates and Plato and and you know, I've, I've read a lot into that. I've had some tremendous teachers come in my life who have introduced me to many of those teachers. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a very like a, a realness in terms of what I experienced about Abraham Lincoln. Of course, a big power and valor and in, in the way in which he held himself, but also it seems like he'd be approachable. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. Like I see as I'm 
growing and expanding more in my delivering and how I'm connecting and reaching to the world, one of the things that I really value the most is that um, I can always be approachable. And I'll say that in groups and in workshops and events and retreats. It's like if something comes up, come talk to me. Like I don't want to be somebody who feels like I'm too terrifying to talk to. And I, and I feel like with, with Lincoln, he feels that way. So I would really, I'd want to talk to him more about like his thoughts and beliefs around human behavior and what he observed in the people that he was working, that was working for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I come to short on, on American history, <laughs> unfortunately, but I've been, I, 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 I've heard some guys talking recently about the Lincoln Monument in Washington, DC. I've actually seen it as well. And mm -hmm. there's something, um, could I even call it mystical about like the myth of Lincoln and how he holds together the American identity? Could, could, is that mm -hmm. something that makes sense to you? Like it's, it's a temple that's dedicated to Lincoln there, right? Like it, it's a real pagan Roman temple somehow. And <laughs> it, it's like the founding of, of the American story. D does this make sense to you? Is this? It, it is. Yeah. And I, and I love it. There is something like, just by the time he came to office, there was this kind of mystical expansive growth that was happening inside the country and I feel the way he was able to communicate that also at the time of what was happening with slavery mm -hmm. and just the shifts and expansions within that as well I think there's a pillar that he held not just as a president but also as just like a man of American history yeah. you know and often if people don't know much about American history they often know maybe a little bit of something about Lincoln. So he really, you know, kind of hold, holds, a, holds a point on many, many of that. <laughs> well, certainly what you said about humility, I think that that rings true is in like the ability to hold that position of, of having a, a kind of a, a servant's humility to, to others <laughs> or something like that, which it seems like something that some of you also talk about. Um, yeah, and, and, and that to me is something I talked about, especially around with men's work is like the difference between power over and power with like I, I love and appreciate male bodied mentors and people whether it's in men's work or in society or in life that are really holding a place of hey I'm holding point here but I want you to stand on my shoulders I want us to hold power together of course like I know how to be a captain I know how to navigate ships I know how to steer the ship but I also want to support those around me to, to rise and to grow and to expand and in doing that we all rise together and it's a I think it's a bit more of an intricate piece that can start to come alive especially when leading groups and working with bigger amounts of people is people need a certain figurehead of who's of steering the ship but they also want to feel you know who's there supporting the vessel as well and can we all actually rise together and I, I love humbling myself like I often will like go to different workshops and trainings and things and humble myself in that way because I know there's something I can learn from everyone. And I want to also always be able to do that because I, the moment I'm not, uh, I'm not learning as a student is the moment I feel like I'm dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wise words. Absolutely. Um, mm. and, and, and we started by saying, well, different lifestyle, <laughs> uh, being a ship captain and, and being a Tantra <laughs> teacher, but, but, at so many similarities actually uh, as you're yeah. pointing out as well right so yeah exactly good so uh, Aaron what I mean so another thing in this section of the talk um, you wrote a book called the embodied man uh, mm. what is an embodied man and how does one become a more embodied man uh, I, 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 let's use five minutes on this I mean we're not going to get to the bottom of it I'm sure uh, yeah 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 a little bit about that so the book is a 350 page kind of masculine manuscript and it's it's a combination of both my own storytelling through life through exploits through adventures through falling flat on my face and with practical practices that people can apply right away um, as they're reading the book because i really wanted something that was both self-development in nature but as well as storytelling in nature. And between both of those, it's going to support someone to kind of meet both sides of their creative inspired self, as well as their dedicated more, you know, wanting to learn and grow self. So for me, you know, the embodied man is kind of what I was saying before. He's not a man that's all in his head. He's actually knows how to drop more deeply into his heart. But in doing that, he knows how to 
balance and equilibrate his thoughts, perceptions, and beliefs. So he has a deeper mastery of the mind. But as a lot of science will show us, as the mind becomes more balanced in its perspective of good and bad, kind and cruel, naughty and nice, you know, all the dynamic balances that are there, then there's going to be neural pathways that actually start to open that open up our heart to have more wisdom affirmation clarity in terms of how it's moving forward so the first part of the book is mastering the mind unraveling the story and then we move into you know the emotional work how can we dive into the emotional body as a man and at the end of the day it's like a lot of men aren't saying okay yeah i'm ready to sign up for emotional work it's like that's the weird scary you know kind of a little bit more crazy stuff but for a man to be more integrated means meeting both of the polarities inside of him. So often people think about masculinity as like, you know, strength, clarity, poise, direction um, in that like single minded focus on, you know, being the one that's, you, you know, that's getting the, the, the game for the village and then bringing back, you know, the, the, the food for, for people or whatever it may be, whatever the prize goal yeah. is. But that's really just a piece of it. So the other thing I really go into in this book is how can, you know, you could say that polar feminine essence and inside a male body, how can that feminine essence start to grow up more? And as she starts to grow up more, then an integration happens. And part of my own journey in meeting this more tantric field, you could call it, was like having situations where you know, I had to experience a deeper surrender in my body, which scared the shit out of my, you know, kind of masculine maritime military self. But the more that I leaned into that and the more I experienced that, then the more strong and clear and directional my masculine became. And this is really where I speak a lot into the, the polarization and the polarity that we work with. And you know, I think the more mastery that happens means that I know thyself, as Hippocrates will say, when you know thyself, then you know all aspects of yourself. And so I had to learn how to have more awareness to the receptivity of my own being and in a greater attunement to the penetrative power of my own being. And so that energy as well is, you know, one of the chapters in the book is awakening, you know, is a sexual awakening. How can we release some of our fear and shame and guilt that we hold either towards others or towards ourself and really having a deeper integration and, and really towards the end of it, after going through gratitude and relationship mastery, the last chapter is about awakening soul purpose. You know, once we master our human experience and we master our masculinity, then the whispers of our soul can start to really share itself into the world. It sounds like a very comprehensive and, and solid uh, approach of the subject. Because uh, what I find a lot of the time people talk about embodiment, uh, it's all about like, oh, get into the body and get out of your head kind of thing, right? Which is which is a very, you know, that they lack, first of all, the balancing aspect that you're talking about and, and the connection of the different centers. And then, there's no awareness there's no awareness of the need for vision at the end of it and it's something that we really speak a lot about in manifesto is like you know until you've until you have a north star that you're orienting towards <laughs> then you 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 it's like you don't know what you're embodying <laughs> so it's like mm -hmm. well what do you actually you know talk, it's like, like oh, i want to become more embodied but what do you want to embody you know like there's so many things that you could be embodying right so you if you just go down into your emotions emotions are very chaotic uh, and so, mm -hmm. so that they will pull you all over the place. And so there can be a value in getting to know that side of yourself. But if you just stay there, you know, you're not going to go anywhere because you're going to, there's just going to be a new thing every, every single day. Right. That, that's probably Yeah. Um, so that makes, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that's one thing I noticed a lot in this field was that in sometimes a more embodied dancing kind of almost heavy on the embodiment field there wasn't as much consciousness and awareness and and place of mindfulness and then sometimes as we see a lot in the mindfulness field people understand all the concepts all the theories all the practices but then 
their their the cells in their body are still dictating something else. So that's really it's a meeting and a merging at the at the center of the heart where the, the all the stuff from the lower chakras from the base and all the the stuff from the upper chakras from the crown and the third eye and all the meditative practices it's all coming down and really opening and expanding at where we are embodied at the soul at the heart at our purpose yeah yeah it's, it's something that um i you know so for yeah when when i explored christianity i i thought that this was nowhere in christianity and, and i've been very surprised to find that this exact idea is in Orthodox Christianity, there's some differences. It, it's seen as very much like the meeting of heaven and earth inside the human being, inside the human person, and as you say, in the heart, which I think is very important. Uh, in in many other traditions, you have more of kind of like the the belly as as a center. And then one difference that is in the Christian tradition is there's a far more, what I would say, um, and, and this is something I think we're going to get more into in the second part of the the, the discussion is the sex centers. And, and, and the mm -hmm. role of that and um, just, yeah, what, how to approach that <laughs> as well, I guess, um, and, mm -hmm. and, and how much focus to be putting there uh, also mm -hmm. with, with, with men in our society today uh, as well, I guess. But, uh, but, but maybe it'll be interesting to hear, you spoke about your first meeting with the world of Tantra and, mm. and this, this, how scary it was to be surrendering can, can you tell a little bit more of that that story uh, of of what happened and um, yeah what that was like uh, like even the specific story of, of your first kind of exploration or some some kind of trans there was some tra was there some transformational thing happening somewhere yeah I mean really I I met this field through through a you know kind of a tantrika a woman I kind of fell in love with when we were in Bali together. And, you know, as we started making love and she was really, you know, opening me more into, you could say, kind of a, a transmission of that. I felt it's actually something that I had been living and breathing quite deeply in the way in which I was making love as well as the way in which I was meeting life. And I just started to have a little bit more context for it. And, you know, in many ways, for many years, I really avoided wanting to have any like association or reference point to teaching tantra because generally i feel like tantra is completely misunderstood it's completely over sexualized and it's very has a lot of negative connotations in terms of how it shows up so my experiences in meeting this field was in really meeting it through a lot of grace and 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 flow and, and inspiration through in being with her and because she really was kind of a, a, a walking transmission of a very powerful teacher and I, you know she's still a dear friend to this day and then i had another um kind of older masculine you know male body mentor come into my life that we initially just connected from the place of like having a love for uh, as a sailor you know, and I was at this event down in New Ze down in New Zealand, and we I was there, and I was a little bit like, this is all these people are a little bit weird. What's going on here? And I was on the back deck of this, um, on the uh, we're at this boathouse in Auckland, and I started chatting with this long-haired kind of uh, white kind of mystic Kiwi guy, and we were just talking about our love for the ocean and just kind of sharing our our, our appreciation. And then I found out later he was one of like the main teachers at this festival. And, you know, he ended up being a really strong mentor in my life to bring together like esoteric teachings with embodiment teachings. I ended up being down at a, um, a mystery school training down in New Zealand several years later. And I just felt this infusion of all of my different worlds. And, and really one of the things that was a big takeaway, because when I did my master's degree, in in you know my early 20s and i started to do coaching and i started to and i was speaking and i was working in this world but i still had my sex life and i, I didn't even think that there'd be any inclusion of the two and not that i wanted them to be included in the two but what i realized as i move more in the in the mindfulness kind of spirituality world there's there was a lot of shadows inside of people who are only kind of at the head and above and, and not really working with the whole body um, so I just found myself after I was introduced into this tantric field that the clients and the people that were coming forth into my world were starting to ask questions more around sexual shame, around, you know, masturbation, around working with sexual energy, around, 
you know, how to be a better lover in the bedroom. And I just naturally, those were things that I was doing well before, you know, I was a Tantra teacher. And, you know, I kind of say I'm probably a little bit of a anomaly in the space of a Tantra teacher, because I used to get laid a lot more before I was teaching Tantra than after the fact. So it's like, it's not something, and, and one of the biggest issues I see inside of this field is that people are utilizing sexual knowledge, wisdom, and expansion for their own kind of benefit. And there's a strong dance inside of this, because like, I still have an animal body, but I also have consciousness. And this is really where I feel like it's, it's an important discussion between animal and consciousness and where can that center point be? So a lot of different places we can go in, in this conversation, but really the field of Tantra fell more and more into my world because I couldn't find any other tradition that or lineage that encapsulated the entirety of the human experience. So when I'm teaching a workshop, I want to be able to work with everything from mindfulness to mind to heart to, to sex center and really create a very uh, full spectrum comprehension of how somebody can work with all areas of their life. And the only world that I've come across that can really meet all of that is the field of Tantra. And that has its challenges as well, because the moment I show up in any space and I'm a male Tantra teacher, there's a, a thousand and one judgments on me often before I've even said hello, you know, and that's because this world, this this lineage is so misunderstood in, in the general population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I can I can tell a little bit about my my background in it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I I got into Tantra, I guess, because I um, was interested in the sex <laughs> and, uh -huh. and woman and uh -huh. and and pleasure and 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 all of these things. Right. And, and so um, and I also felt like I had reached all the goals that I thought that I wanted or needed to that I was aiming for in my life and there was something missing. And so I was looking for what's the next thing. I was coming from an atheist background. I'm curious as well if you if you had a relationship to spirit or God before you got into Tantra and, and if that shifted as well, just to kind of get that alignment, if that's something we shared or. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, there was like in, when I was doing my master's degree, I found a place called Agape which is a transdenominational spiritual center, which really kind of looks at Ernest Home, science of mind, kind of a full spectrum, religious, non-denominational space where spirit is recognized inside of all. And there's a, a mentor of mine who showed up quite strongly at that time, Michael Beckwith. Um, so you were already on so, the kind of spiritual, well on the spiritual path uh, when you- Yeah, and, yeah. and, and definitely the, the masters in spiritual psychology that kind of, you know, framed things up in many ways. You know, spirit to me, I was raised Jewish, mm -hmm. never really felt deeply connected to Judaism, but there's certain principles of that that I could appreciate, you know, and to me, I'm always just looking at all of the different things and seeing which one really rings true inside of my heart and soul. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I got into it as a you know practitioner. I went to some courses with different schools, and you know experienced also a lot of the same things that you're talking about, like massive transformation, insights about the nature of reality, the nature of myself, um, things that I had uh, suppressed that were suddenly released, and which felt incredibly good <laughs> to to be released. So so there was an alignment and an integration that happened. And so I, and I think what it came from was really, you know, like it, it was time for me to sh take a shift in life. I'd grown up with a very specific mindset and a very specific operating system about what life was about. And that had got me so far, but it, it was mm -hmm. time for an update, right? And, and, and so I entered into a time of transition. And the way I see it is I kind of went into a journey into chaos into the underworld right uh, and mm -hmm. i went and this is this is the hero's journey is to to enter the underworld um mm -hmm. and um and 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 yeah like had uh, i went from being a kind of seeing myself as an isolated disconnected part in a cold universe from you know that was run by evolution basically uh to to being spirit uh, and and to seeing spirit in all things and and seeing how mm. 
all of those things were connected and that was mm -hmm. beautiful and amazing and powerful and so much so that after some time with this i i quit my job i was running a successful consulting company at microsoft as my biggest customer uh was living in thailand rock climbing uh you know most of the day came home in the afternoon took a zoom call sent a couple of emails and sent a bill to microsoft right so things were good mm -hmm. but it was just not satisfying at all um and mm. so then i started seeking out the the most well-established spiritual you know spiritual sexual tantra teachers in, that i could find and i i think mm -hmm. i connected you know I, I i sometimes i say like i found like the world's best leading tantra teachers or something like that i don't i don't know if there's a if there's like a, a an order or a hierarchy or something like that so <laughs> i'm not going to mention any names on this meeting um but i yeah. i organized workshops for these people in copenhagen i invited them to come to copenhagen they stayed in my home and I organized workshops for them to to come and do their stuff. And I and I, I then started my own education. I called it Sakai education. Uh, and, mm -hmm. I, I, and I invited basically, I was the organizer uh, and I just worked to serve these teachers. And, and I did it as a mm -hmm. way of getting to hang out with them and get to know them basically. And, mm -hmm. and then I, I lived in some communities and exotic islands together with different uh, spiritual teachers and Tantra teachers and started doing my own teaching and stuff like that as well. Uh, mm. and, and, and more and more what i think i saw was um yeah it was many different things i saw obviously with many different people but i would say there were several trends one of them was a a kind of uh and now i'm going to start with my my critic criticisms and so what i see is what i warned you with oh, is that I, I believe that some of these things are systemic in the whole field of new mm -hmm. age spirituality um mm -hmm. and and but i i also believe that new age spirituality has an important role um, mm -hmm. but, but I, I think that sometimes, you know, you're supposed to go into the underworld and then it's dangerous if you stay there, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. or it, there's a lot of risks in, in hanging out and becoming the king of the underworld, right? So Baal is, is the God in the Bible who was the king of, of the underworld basically. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he totally beat all the other gods, but then he ended up getting hell and had to be, become the king there or something yeah. like that. Um, that's at least the story of the ball cycle. Um, but, but what I, what, what I saw was that these teachers had one life on social media and on their websites, um, and then meeting them in purpose and get, getting to know them close to them in their, in their actual inner circle was a very different experience. There was mm -hmm. a lot of chaos, uh, and mm. a constant trail of drama behind them, normally mm. because of, uh, multiple sexual concurrent relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. with, with, with different people. And, um, and then, you know, a kind of like a switching between like, uh, uh, a, 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 a very kind of like everything is great and everything is perfect and the world is exactly the way it should be to, uh, a, a kind of like a, a very, mm, yeah, conflictual approach to injustice and and not being treated well or something like that which i felt was based often on a misunderstanding of um the existence of you you, call, you spoke about naughty and nice and, and nice and good and bad or something like that but like you know that just like living very privileged people living very comfortable lives in very exotic islands and stuff like that having everything they needed uh, and and not ever having to really deal with with suffering in life mm, uh, and, mm. and and not being able to handle suffering and and their spiritual systems often being um incapable of handling being the confrontation with not only suffering but also with evil you know like you know mm. there is evil there are terrible things in existence you know there are child rapists and there <laughs> are people who are totally psychopathic and and there are you know demonic forces i think i i can use that word and, mm. and and not you know just like there the total naivety to those kinds of things and i'm talking very much about myself as well because there was also a trail trail of drama around me and you know i had this like <laughs> desire to like you know i wanted to like create this long-term loving relationship with one woman um and then the, for me this is this is the the big lie in tantra is like you can go out and have sex with as many people as you want and it has no consequences there's no the, it's, it's mm. okay it's a spiritual practice you do it as a spiritual practice then it's all you know like it's all just beautiful and great and 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 so you had these powerful experiences with many different people and you spread yourself out 
mm -hmm. a lot. You, you end up becoming very fragmented. So that's a whole lot of stuff. Maybe I should give you a chance now. No, no, I, I th yeah, I, I love what you're sharing. And, you know, what, what you're bringing forth is absolutely a lot of my own challenges I see inside the system. You know, and I, you know, where I sit right now, I teach inside of a, a variety of different containers, if you will, inside of this tantric field, inside of sacred sexuality, inside of men's work. And each one has its own kind of unique set of values. And there's things I love about each one. There's things that I don't like about each one, but I like it because, you know, one of the things that the first point I'll make is like, Tantra isn't all sex. It, 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 it never was, it never will be, but it's completely misunderstood that way because it is the lineage that works with sex. But if anyone listening to this goes to a tantric workshop and all they do for the entire time is talk about sex, then that's probably more of a sacred sexuality workshop, which is a little bit different. If you're not working with, you know, some work around communication, around mantras, around third eye opening practices, around like meditation, then it's not really falling inside of that. So the other thing that does happen inside of a lot of Tantra is that trail of drama. And, you know, my, my last partner and I, who we run Embodied Awakening Academy, we actually changed the name when I first met her. There was a school that she had started with her ex-partner called the Laya Tantra School. It's now called Embodied Awakening because that really feels like the nature of what we're doing is is bringing awakening into embodiment, uh, the awakening of, of, of our body, the awakening of our whole being, and bringing divinity into the body. And what happens often in spiritual traditions is, as I mentioned earlier, a bit more of a, an ascending into this kind of out of body transpersonal experiences, which is great, but we're still pooping and shitting and, and burping and living inside this body. And it's like, we can't deny the body. So how can I bring more awareness, more presence, more love into this body? And the piece around sexuality is that relationship, I think, is one of the greatest spiritual practices. So being that relationship is a profound spiritual practice and that Tantra can include sexuality, it makes sense why a lot of schools only work with relationship and sexuality, because there's a lot of learning that happens with that. But the piece I'll speak into is around like an and a tremendous amount of responsibility. And I say that because as I've recognized with myself, as I'm growing and expanding in my reach in the world as a teacher, then the judgments and the, the things that are placed on me are strong, but also the projections. And I can see that when I'm in front of a group of people, like if my sexual shadows aren't in alignment, that I can use and manipulate that energy to how any way I want. But as I said earlier, like I, like my objective in working with sexuality, and this is just me personally, isn't the objective to try to get laid and to try to get partners. And I feel like there's a fair amount, I won't name names, but there's a fair amount of that in this world. And on another can side I, to that, can it's I not- Can I just dig a little bit more yeah. to that? So do you have a policy yeah. about, about sexual relationships or sexual contact with, with, with other people or students or people that you meet in different settings that you stick to? Do you have like a fixed policy about that? Yeah, within our academy, we have, the, we have no genital touch inside of our workshops and we also don't engage with our students you know but then when i'm running my men's retreats there's kind of a a, a different framework with that and then a, another couple organizations i teach with they have a different framework each one i see the the values of what it brings like i can feel so for the with the academy when we have that policy one of the things that I saw, especially with Raven and I teaching together, is it kind of puts us in this seat as, okay, we're teachers and we're kind of untouchable in a way. And, and for the learning evolutionary part, that's actually quite beneficial. But for the day-to-day -day humanness of us also being human and sharing our humanness, that can have its own shadow. Mm -hmm. I look at a, another organization I teach with and they, you know, they have policies where at certain times with approval their teachers can you know engage sexually with students and their students are 
you know, make the request and that space is there. I generally feel 95% of the time, I don't think that's beneficial, but I do feel like sometimes there's, there's times when that comes forth where with consent, with clarity and things happening outside of the workshop space, then that can be beneficial but it's all different parameters because the thing around sexuality is that sex money and power is where the greatest shadows lie and one of the things i see that happen in the tantric institutions i know where it's teacher completely separate from all of their students is that there's a often an unconscious projection that happens towards the teacher in a way around sex, money, and power. And whereas the institutions I see where they just put all of that on the table and there's no running, there's no hiding, there's nowhere to go, it can be a little bit more of a chaotic show and it creates even more of a fine-tuned capacity to facilitate in that space. Mm -hmm. But when it's done with sovereignty and with clarity, it actually can be quite beautiful. And at the end of it, one of the, you know, a teacher who I appreciate came into my life in Dairy States, Osho. And one of the things I love in what he says is like, we kind of live in a walking contradiction. It's like, you know, there's always going to be two, two sides to it. And one side has all these right reasons and wrongdoings. And this other side has all these right doings and wrongdoings. And, you know, it reminds me of a quote from Rumi. It's like beyond the field of right doing and wrongdoing is a field and I'll meet you there. That's a transpersonal field. That's a field beyond this flesh body. So, but I want to, to navigate more masterfully this human body. It's also playing inside of some of the, 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 the challenges and the things that come up in a masterful, uh, clear, transparent and honest way. It's when what I feel like you were sharing earlier is sometimes the evolution of this field is, hasn't been as much transparency and honesty. And what I notice for myself is that the moment there's any bit of me that's not being 100% honest with my fellow teachers or with any of the students I'm working with, then it's very, very quickly for shadows and unconscious patterns and behaviors to lurk in. So it re really requires a deep impeccability and responsibility to keep honesty and transparency. Yeah. So th there's so many things that we can go into here, but I, I want to try and go at like what I, what I see is like the roots of, of this thing. And, and it's yeah. really the understanding of sexuality uh, and, and what mm. that is, because you, you use the term sacred sexuality and you used about like, you know, bringing the divine or something like that. Um, and what I really see a lot of the time is instead of sacred sexuality, I see like cheap, like flea market sexuality, basically taking sexuality mm. and putting it out for everybody, you know? So like it just becomes, it becomes cheapened. It's something that you just do with, with like oh, somebody who can help you out with something to, to get a hold of something like that. Whereas, you know, like for, for me, what, what I've come to realize is like, if I spent the rest of my life, dedicating yeah. all of my energy to really uniting myself with one woman in every way, you know, with every center of my being, I would, I would just scrape the surface. <laughs> There's so much depth there. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and this approach in these workshops where it's just about like, it, you know, it, it is, you know, you say like sometimes the students will project something onto the teacher. It's like every time uh, where if you put yourself up as a Tantra teacher, that's going to happen all that. That's, that's a guarantee. It's going to be constant. And, 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 you know, there's this, there's a culture created straight away about, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's about centering intense sexual experience basically. And, and it's a chasing of those experiences. Uh, and so, and so people start compromising more and more and more on, on their boundaries in order to chase more intense sexual experiences with each other. And, and what I see is, is groups, communities of people who are fairly, you know, either have serious sex addiction problems, often with uh, using drugs at the same time as well, uh, to, to intensify their sex addiction, combining with the drug addiction. Um, and, 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 you know, jumping into bed with each other, left, right, and center, um, at Tantra festivals. This is what I've been doing. This is what I've seen. Um, and, and, and cheapening their sexuality. So it's the opposite mm. of, 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 of sacred sexuality for me. Well, and, and what you're sharing, I absolutely can appreciate 150%. And I've had a few points in the last several years where 
especially when I was teaching with the academy where, you know, we run a seven day retreat called Living Tantra. One of the days is around, is around sexuality. That's literally like yeah. only one of the days. Every other day is around different aspects of the tantric experience. So in that, in that sense, one of the reasons, you know, my last partner, Raven, she started and created this school for all of the reasons you're saying and so much more. So, and we get so many people that come to our retreats that are like, oh my God, this is actually a grounded academy that's not supporting ch people chasing peak experiences. And I, I really value and appreciate that. And I found myself standing on the outside, seeing a lot of, seeing some other things that were happening in other schools. And I, I, I saw this point where it's like, I could be in the place of, I can just kind of look out of the far and not get as much in, entwined with it. Or I can also actually bring myself into that container and bring myself fully, which is in my perspective, not needed for me, but necessary for the evolution of this, of this work. So what you're saying, I completely agree with. And I also find myself being a bridge between a lot of the older people that have been in this field for a long time, some of the younger people and literally dancing in between worlds like i could you know share a lot of different stories inside of this but you talked about this for hours and each side has their own level of shadows and understandings and 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 ways in which they're not being integrated and you know it's it's not necessarily like a a hat that i i love wearing but i'm also willing to bring myself and to be the change that i want to see in an industry in a world to start to make some changes to have more trauma informed awareness, mm -hmm. to have more less peak sexual experiences and more integrated embodied experiences that are leaving people back home in their own heart. And it takes some time and it takes some energy because I do feel at the core of Tantra isn't cheap sexual experiences. It's actually deeply embodied, empowered, divine places where God is at the three way inside of relationships. And I, you know, still feel like deep, you know, monogamy is one of the most powerful relationship evolutionary tools that we can be a part of. And there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. I generally think polyamory 90, 95% of the time is a messy thing that doesn't necessarily work. I think it can work with a tremendous amount of transparency, honesty, and clarity. But yeah, there's always going to be a mess. There's always mess in, in, in many different ways. So um, I, I love what you're saying. And I think there, there's, there's a lot of unpacking of it in many different sides. Okay. Um, I think yeah, we have time for like kind of two more, two more things, I think, to go both directions from here. Uh, so like, let's yeah, try yeah. and get them both. And one of them, I think, is, is just looking out on our society a little bit. And I, I want to give you my kind of view on like what's happening, especially with young men in our society. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one I want to go is into like kind of ideas of solutions and, and see if we can talk a little bit about that. Um, for so, sure. So, so what I see we're living in is a, is a hypersexualized society um, mm. where, where young men grow up on porn. Uh, mm. and they lack meaningful um, endeavors to engage themselves in their life. They're mm. often, especially in the West, very, very comfortable. Um, they fulfill all of their needs for conquest and uh, <laughs> whatever through computer games a lot of the time. Um, and, and, so, and, and, and a lot of them are just fascinated by sex. Uh, so their mm -hmm. mind is, is focused on sex very, very, a lot of the time and a lot of them have difficulty connecting with with real women because they've been watching more and more extreme porn you know because you get as you get used to porn that it, it, you 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 need more and more weird and wonderful stuff to get the same kick out of it as well right and so i think there's a large portion of our men in our society who who who, who are doing this um and have a unhealthy extreme associate or sub, yeah kind of focus on on pornography or on sexuality in, in general um your book ends with the same towards purpose. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that's a massive key <laughs> to realign guys. Um, and so what I wonder is, is if men are attracted into a spiritual tradition, which is dominated and often identified with 
um, peak sexual experience, which, which you know, it is often the case, generally because we have all these people running around calling themselves tantra teachers who actually know nothing about real tantric tradition. Like, you know, the tent, the, the, the yoga, the, the sutras, you know, and all of these old texts are like a very, very ancient tradition that need to be passed on through transmission. You can't get it from reading a book or having some other Westerner who's like, you know, been on India or on a backpacking trip or something like that. You, that's not how you get these things transmitted, you know? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, so, 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 you know, they've, they've been on some workshop, they had some, like, they read a couple of books, they got some good ideas and then they're a Tantra teacher, but it's all, you know, it's really becomes about sex. So, so I, I think if you attract people into your spiritual tradition with, you know, these kinds of promises, then they're there for the wrong reason. <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. why you're going to continue to have systemic issues of drama and chaos and misdirected, you know, despite lots of good intentions, because I, I seriously mm -hmm. believe that you and most people in this field have very, very good intentions and are working hard to, to be a force for good. They see the problems they're trying to do, they're doing their best to deal with it as honestly as they possibly can. And, and, and things just, they don't really, they, they keep on getting stuck. They keep on, you know, that, so, so yeah, that, that, that's just my, 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 my mm. societal thing. And so, yeah, what's your, what's your thoughts on that one? Well, I mean, on the first point around porn, I completely uh, can appreciate and understand. You know, I, I as a as a merchant mariner, you know, I'd, I'd get onto a ship and they'd they'd show me my stateroom, they'd show me where I work, they'd show me where I'd eat, and then they'd say, "How big is your porn collection?" You know, that was pretty standard operations when you're getting on a ship for you know three to four months with twenty to twenty five guys. It's like you need porn to almost in a way. So, yeah, I, I definitely had my strong journey with porn. And unfortunately, that is a big way in which young men, especially young boys, start to learn around learn about sexuality. So when I look at that side of things, and I look at the redefining of sexuality through a lot of the work that I do. I mean, as I said, the first online course that I ever made was a conscious man's guide to the bedroom. And one of the chapters in that is like, redefining pornography and redefining one's relationship to that addiction it has less to do with the pornography and more to do with the chemicals being released through having that masturbation addiction and learning how to bring pleasure and touch back to the body to know the body temple to know thyself to know their own inner union so i think what you're saying for sure there's there are systemic issues inside of this field but i also know that the consciousness that I and again I can only speak for myself I know where I've gone inside of personal development and I know like there's a lot of different ways that I could lead the next 15 20 years of my life and I might get to a point where I'm like you know what I'm done with this thing called Tantra and I'm just going to be in this other world and, and I have friends that have done that and I understand I can appreciate that and I also feel quite strongly with setting a positive framework for what Tantra can be. And, I, and I'll use another example. Several years back, you know, I was just beginning to land more in, in Ubud in Bali, which is a big community, a lot of expats coming in and out. And, you know, myself as well as my partner, we started doing some workshops and started to create kind of a Tantric community. And the only thing that people ever really understood around Tantra there before was just like play parties. And they were like, oh, that must be. And it's like, no. A, a, a play temple sex party isn't isn't tantra and so in that situation just a small community we started to reshape what that could be and you know several years later now like there's really a bigger tribe of people there that have a deeper understanding of what the embodiment of tantra is so that's just one little city and community now i can stand outside and say ah these people are doing that and they're doing this and there are these systemic is issues but i'm like just like i shared at the beginning of this interview my nature is to like go against the grain and to like show up in a way and be the embodiment of something different you know like the end of this last weekend i just taught a fundamentals of tantra and i had quite a few female bodies of varying ages coming up and they're like thank you thank you for like showing me what this tradition can be and thank you for not being you know a sleazy you know sexy you know tantra teacher that's just trying to fuck everyone like i really feel it and i i see where their judgments are i can see where they come from 
I can see how that might boost some part of my ego in some whatever way, or I can just say thank you. Like I'm, thank you for seeing that because that to me is inspiring. And I know that I'm listening to my own heart soul, to my own soul's wisdom and showing up in this way and redefining what Tantra can really be and show up as in the world. Thanks for sharing. Um, so yeah, moving, moving towards uh, solutions or proposed <laughs> solutions. Um, you know, so manifesto in some ways, we, we dip our toes into spirituality. At the end of the day, we, we you know, we, we say what we do is we, we bring men together and we allow them to just appreciate each other's company for a short time. And that seems to have a very transformational effect on men. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we, we really, it's been a, a, a really powerful thing. Um, one of the dangers of being in spirituality is becoming a cult, right? Is, is or <laughs> developing cult like things. We have this tendency as humans to, um, you know, see icons of the divine, things that point us towards the divine, and we turn them into idols, right? And 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 so they, especially people do this with teachers, um, but also you know, tantra becomes an idol, or men's work becomes an idol. You know, people start thinking like, oh, everything is king, warrior, magician, lover, and I just need to be a king, and then everything's going to be great. So I'm going to be more kingy in my whatever, right? It's like <laughs> this is this is a good pointer for like a, a way to think about your behavior but if you make it like the central thing in your life and you, you create a religion out of it then it's it's dangerous right so so what i've realized more and more is i need to point outside of what i'm doing for some to something bigger than myself and bigger than my own work so that mm -hmm. i point the people who come to me to say well you know like i'm doing some stuff and this might help you and you can try it out as well but but that you know and I, but the reason everything that i'm doing i'm basing it on this Mm. and pointing up to something else all the time and, and and i've been really thinking like what can i do what can i point to that that people can relate to as well mm. you know, because because i like I'm, I'm not pointing to like the christian god because um that's not my mission you know i can you can read about what manifesto is about in other places but i i specifically create retreats where where we have people from different traditions um that, mm -hmm. that come together and and we have that conversation so it's the kind of like inter faith ecumenical approach or something like that whatever you want to call it um but but what i've really been thinking more and more is pointing towards family mm. um, because i believe that family healthy good loving families are are a fundamental building block of society and life mm -hmm. everybody has a mom and a dad you can't live without having a mom and a dad and and mm -hmm. they will be you know it's i think especially your mother's love <laughs> and your mother's presence with you and her compassion and her ability to be patient with this little screaming shitting thing <laughs> non-sleeping thing sometimes uh that that sets a lot of our real basic hardwiring of of who we are i guess and then i think mm -hmm. that role of a father in your life as well is, is vital um, mm. and so so i i, I think that you know, we're seeing a situation where our civilization right now in the West, you know, if you want to talk about purpose, like here's a good purpose, like our, our civilization seems to be losing energy, even collapsing, one could say. Western democracy mm. seems to be really struggling, increasingly so. Um, and, and I think a lot of it can be traced back to total breakdown of families, uh, a, 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 even a rejection of family for many, many people, people thinking. And, mm -hmm. and so this is my experience of the Tantra world as well, is that the, the family is generally seen down. A lot of people come from families with bad parents uh and, mm. and there's a kind of a, a it's like oh, well i don't you know like no, don't talk to me about my family I, I almost felt a little bit embarrassed about my family in, in many tantra um kind of mm. age spirituality things I, I felt like it was weird to talk about family somehow um, mm. and, and more and more i'm thinking like that's where we need to go we need to talk about like how do we what does it take to create strong families that can actually want to have kids again because right now mm -hmm. like you know there's plenty of other cultures that are creating lots of kids um, but but we're not doing very well in the West. Um, mm. And so, yeah, one can think like, oh, well, we've got more than enough people and it's going to destroy the planet or anything like that. that that's one perspective. But I actually don't buy that. I, I believe that. I, I, I've noticed that the more I love life, the more I want to have kids. And, mm -hmm. and that love of life is, is a love of existence. <laughs> and and, and mm -hmm. that's what really brings me into a place of yeah of, of that and i'm also learning so much from it so i just had a, my second my second son is now uh, one and a half years old and you know the, the container of me and his mom <laughs> us together it's nothing could be a more powerful vehicle for growth there is no tantra workshop 
that could connect me more to ideas of love and um, absolutely and beauty than, than that like that it kicks the pants off anything you could do at in a bali retreat or something mm-hmm. like that but to undermine what you should do and i should add here as well you know like you know there, there's been many things that i've got from my experiences in tantra which have been incredibly valuable you know like uh, mm-hmm. I, I reached a point where i realized i was very disconnected from my sexuality i was i was uh, i was driven by something that wasn't me anymore actually and as far as my sexuality was concerned and so yeah. It hasn't been it hasn't been all terrible, but yeah. <laughs> that was my my conclu- my closing conclusion. So it's got a pass now. Uh so we've been going uh for just almost the time that we agreed on. So let, let's hear your your finishing words and then we can um close this one off. Yeah, I I love what you share there. And you know, for me, like the first chapter in the book The Embodied Man is unraveling the story, and I share a lot about like helping people redefine and work through a lot of their challenges with mom and dad and, and the things that they're still held on to. And I I bring in stories around family quite often because I think there's a heart and a space of connection. There's a there's a vulnerability that's present. There's a truth that's present. You know, some of the great t- spiritual teachers often say, you know, you think you're enlightened and then you go home. You know, can you can you be you know, just as enlightened as a teacher on stage as you are when you're, you know, making dinner with mom and dad, you know, and, and, and what does that mean? What does that look like? And I love that you bring that in because to me, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And the way you do everything is the way you do one thing. So if I can, you know, be like being tantric to me is showing up where love is at the center, it's showing up and saying, hey, how, what, what does love do now? And not a, you know, mushy, gushy, lost in the sky, pie in the, an illusionary love, but actually an embodied way of being with life where you, you're open, you're expanded, you're, you're powerful, you're clear, you've moved through the shadows around sex, money, and power, and you know power with, you have an abundance in your heart, you feel the life force of sexuality that's brought you and I here to have this conversation, the sperm and the egg meeting to create life, the magical mystery of that. And the beautiful thing when I can know to start to harness that sexual energy in a way that inspires me to the mission, purpose, and vision of my life, of the soul that's in that that that's, that's inside of this bioelectric magnetic flesh suit, then all of that, no matter where I'm I'm concentrating that energy towards whether it's family whether it's back to myself whether it's for my community my tribe my you know my students my the my my teachers no matter who it is i'm aligned to 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 god's will this grand organized design of existence that's moving through me in a way where i can go to bed every night and say hey i've given it my all i'm in tune with the love inside my heart and that same feeling happens when I'm on my deathbed and I can say, hey, I used all the gifts I had. I, you know, shared the love inside my family. I learned a lot. I met my edges. I met the places of growth. And this is what I gave back. And this is my vision. And this is how I am in the world. So to me, all of this conversation is around a deeper mastery of the human experience. And when I have mastery of the human experience and I know how to move energy from my crown to my base and my base to my crown and i can actually show up as a beneficial presence on this planet yeah well thank you aaron uh really really (laughs) interesting um and yeah i mean so many so many things that we agree on and then and then there's just some fundamental differences which i think create an interesting tension and and a good discussion as well um for sure I, i i appreciate you you doing this with me um, I'm not going to say you can call me brother yet. I would have to meet each other. <laughs> uh, before you come. After, after I give you a hug, bro. Uh, <laughs> no, bro. Uh, Paul, after I give you a hug, Paul. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. No, I, I have very few people that call that. I have one biological brother, and then I have a very few men that I, that I, that I really have developed over a very long time. A, a closeness with and, and for me I, I, this thing of using things too much they get worn down and they get spread out and i used to go around calling other men brother all the time as well and and i realized like no i, I actually want there to be something sacred and for something to be sacred it needs to be more hidden more more private we need to mm. 
we we, we live in a, in a society that's just like you know flattened everything out and put everything out on display with social media right and so if we're you know our, our shared mission of bringing the sacred back um I, I think it's happening in society i think everybody's becoming aware of it i think it's it's spreading like wildfire um, and, it, and it, it's very chaotic at the moment there's all kinds of weird and wonderful things happening so i think yeah. we're very careful like what is it that we put in the center uh in in, in that space of i i lo love and appreciate what you're sharing and, and thank you for bringing that in i i honor and i hear you for sure good <laughs> yeah um, I actually said I'd give you the final word, but it looks like I've gone and done it myself. Um, <laughs> so, so Aaron, yeah, I mean, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, much appreciated. And um, we'll, I think we'll continue to have contact. Let's see where this can go. That sounds good.